Everything is in their control. It is always about them. It is their money, it is their house, it is their car, it's their nails, it's their hair. Everything is theirs. All of your decisions are theirs. You are not your own person. No, you are owned. In fact, you're not a person. You're a commodity. You are property. And that is how you are viewed and that is how you are treated. How does a teenager become a target for human trafficking in her suburban high school in Katy, Texas? How does a pimp brainwash someone to the point they leave home and then sell themselves for that pimp? How does a victim escape and rebuild their life? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. Today, our guest host, Epic Times senior reporter Charlotte Cuthbertson, sits down with Courtney Litvak to hear her exclusive first-hand account of surviving the horrors of sex trafficking. Courtney, it's fantastic to have you on American Thought Leaders. It's a pleasure. Glad to be here, man. <laughs> um, you are a sex trafficking survivor, which is just, it's amazing you're here today to, to tell a piece of your story, and I really appreciate that. Um, it's such a hidden phenomena in the United States and so for you to have the courage to come out and tell people and, and help educate people is, is amazing. So thank you, thank you for that. Can you just paint us a little bit of a picture? You came from the all-American family which is, oh that wouldn't happen to our family, that wouldn't happen to me. Um, can you paint a little picture for us about your gro growing up, who you were, what your dreams were? I look back to my childhood and me and my, um, my younger brother would just be like, man, those were much simpler times. We really don't have any bad negative thoughts when it comes to the way that we were raised. It was a very bright time. We had great hopes for the future. I was raised in the church, so I had great core values built on my faith. You know, I didn't necessarily know I could have a relationship with God, but I attended church on Sundays. This kept me grounded. I had a very structured routine. I began um, swimming on the swim team at a young age. This was a place where I could find something I was passionate about. I was very good at it. This drove my competitive spirit and just made me dream about all the things that I felt I was going to accomplish in life. And soon after I was able to overcome the brainwashing and the denial I was facing, I was reconnected with my roots. And I'm so privileged to have had that upbringing that so many people are not as fortunate to have. And I like to own that because that does make a huge difference in knowing to be able to compare something to how you were once raised to the life that you're living now and start to realize that there's a huge difference and you have that gut feeling that something's wrong but a lot of people don't have something to compare their current situation to. But I was very fortunate to grow up and have a wonderful childhood. And if you could, could you take us a little bit about um, how you were groomed, this whole grooming process, which now that I've learned more about it, is extremely sophisticated yes. and, and very intentional. And can you explain a little bit about that from the inside of, of being groomed? Yes. So what I would like to first reference is that the crime of human trafficking and specifically sex trafficking has been going on for quite some time. I'm not going to be the first person this has happened to and I will not be the last. But the way that this crime has developed and become so methodical and well organized has been advanced in our day and age where technology is reigning, especially in the youth. When I was in high school, people were getting called out and written up in class all the time for being on their cell phone during the whole period. This was years ago. The amount that technology has escalated since that point has only added to the easier access to children, to minors, to people who are naive as I once was. And I could have never admitted that then. But being able to seemingly establish these trustworthy, authentic relationships with someone behind a screen did not seem like a far-fetched thing. That was very possible with the connection you can make to these people with social media. The main two social media platforms that the grooming process specifically took place in my life was with direct messaging on Instagram and with private messaging on the Snapchat app. 
Now these apps had developed over time and they're more advanced even now than they once were, but those were ways for me to be able to seemingly go under the radar, to not be full-blown text messaging, which was easier for law enforcement, for anybody to get a hold of those messages, but somehow it was more private and it was an easier access because if I didn't have a phone, um, someone would give me a burner phone. That was a common um, thread because I would get my phone taken up. My family was constantly on me and managing and checking in and keeping track of my social life, taking up my phones, but I was able to go into the school next day and receive a new burner phone or an iPod, something that had internet access on it. You're not always going to have messaging but you do have these apps where you're able to communicate in full-blown private messaging under the radar. So what a main key factor of this grooming stage is, first it's establishing most of the time the relationship over a phone. And you're going to grow to trust this person enough to where you'll allow them to pick you up at night, you will sneak out. This was something that took place in my personal story. I began sneaking out at night. And this was somebody who knew a mutual friend of a mutual friend. So typically somebody who you sit next to in one of your classes, somebody who you've known since junior high, a familiar face, somebody who you've heard their name before. That establish, establishes credibility to make you more willing to trust this person who they're repping for and you know they're talking up and saying this is someone who you can trust and I'm going to put you in contact with this person. So it is very well organized and it's very well networked. It is never a one-man show. There are multiple people who go into making this whole system work. And it's so important for people to understand the different parts of the grooming stage but to fully understand the main factor is establishing trust. And a very big focal point of that is them gaining control, slowly but surely, which is like those mental, psychological chains that are not visible on the outside. But over a process and period of time, this mental control is so profound, but at the same time it can be so subtle to someone who doesn't know what to look for. But once that mental control is established, physical control can be gained as well. In the grooming process, that is what is, in, it is intended for. It is a bridge. You do not get from point A to point Z without any transition or in between. The grooming process can take months. For some people, it can take weeks. But commonly, a person who is in school, as I was, who had never had experience in this lifestyle before, I wasn't about to be this person who was actually referenced as prude. People knew me as someone I didn't like to cuss. I came a long way since then. But at the time, it was very outlandish, very hard to believe that I could start distributing the behaviors I was, but it was because these people invested in me. They took their time and they slowly broke down those barriers and boundaries to where I myself had not noticed the process in which I had strayed so far and gotten to the end point and not even understood where I had begun from and come so far and just started falling down that path and going into that dark place. And that was a big part of me eventually then leaving my home and establishing a life with these people. And it was actually people who I had never even met before because I was handed off from one person to another. And that is a big part of this, is understanding that that network, people have different roles. And what's so dangerous, and what's so important for us to speak up about how this is happening to children, it's one thing for this to happen to adults. This is never justifiable. But in this grooming process, the most vulnerable people, someone who's never had experience in this life, they don't know the terminology. They don't know what's really being asked of them. They don't understand what will be their reality when they lose control. And that's exactly what happened to me. And once being handed off to these people, I realized that the friend of mine, whom I met for the first time the day that I was going to be dropped off to my first trafficker, was promised a finder's fee for my life. And my life was worth a sum to that person up to that point, and was reason enough for them to grew me over a period of almost a year. And I was being groomed by multiple people at the same time. So this can vary in many different ways, but that process and that bond is still the same. And then I wasn't gonna see that person again and was handed off to a stranger 
who was going to become my first trafficker. That's crazy. It, you had such a great childhood. You ended up getting trafficked. How, how did you become one of the targets for these people? So something that I really like to speak up to is that I myself experienced a severe traumatic event. In high school, I was assaulted. I had something taken from me, and I became a changed person after that, seeking coping mechanisms, trying to medicate myself, being exposed to smoking and to excessive drinking, and that, that pushed one domino over from another and led me down this path. But to go back to saying that I experienced a traumatic event, every person in that age, even earlier, junior high, elementary school, they will experience something in life that leaves them hurt, disappointed, betrayed, and they will want to fill that void of whichever experience has left in their spirit with something to feel, to feel accepted, to feel loved, seeking validation, affirmation, and these are things that you soon realize you are willing to do anything to obtain. And so going from my childhood into this situation, what was so heartbreaking to me was my community, the city of Katy, the city of Houston. Katy is a suburb of Houston, but my hometown where I grew up, my peers, my people who were once my close friends, some people who I had given time and energy and nothing but love into those relationships after knowing me for years and years just were able to accept that conclusion that Courtney is choosing to be this person not understanding something had to have happened in between don't you know my heart don't you know who I am by now this is not something that I chose and that was a very difficult reality for me to face, but I realized that was the gap. That is the missing space between who is personally impacted by this, and by then it's too late unless you do have resources available to you, which Childproof America is here to provide, but at the time we didn't have that. So all these outsiders were believing everything they saw on the internet. One of my roles as Child Proof America Ambassador is to do peer-to-peer -peer intervention. So not only is the information I'm sharing with you from my personal story, but combined information that I've gathered from many different people who have been impacted by this in my home city, in my hometown, in the same school district I was at. This has been happening there. It's continuing to happen. And you are able to point out the patterns when you realize that these are all similar cases that can vary per person. But all of these people have experienced something in their lives that has left them, I don't even like the word vulnerable, but susceptible. You shouldn't go through a terrible life experience or a loss, and then that means that people are allowed to have access to you. You're now labeled as a target and vulnerable. No, in life you should never have to worry that going through life means that now you have to be a target on, with a target on your back and that this can happen to you because something bad has occurred in your life to make you vulnerable. No, we need to do better at understanding these gaps and letting people know that this does not happen overnight. This is not that person's fault. This is a very strategic, methodical process. It is organized crime. There are ulterior motives and the people who are taking children Adults, girls, boys, this crime does not discriminate. They are master manipulators and they understand there are these gaps in society and they feed off of that. My trafficker fed off of that, trying to convince the public that I was okay. Tell the public, no, this is who Courtney is now. It was all scripted and people could not remember that Courtney who they once knew. Yes, I was a shell of the Courtney that everybody once knew and recognized. I was unrecognizable, but nobody was able to put two and two together to say we are missing something here. And that lack of information is very dangerous and it is very hurtful and pushed me further and further into that life. And you were talking about earlier that uh, your, one of your first traffickers was actually a woman. I mean, I think that's a, harder for people to understand that women are involved in this industry 
yes. as well. I had a woman as a trafficker. That happens to people. That is not a special case. That is happening every day. Um, you touched on the brainwashing. I, I think that's possibly one of the more difficult things for people to understand. Um, we heard from an FBI agent earlier today. A lot of people think, oh, why didn't you just seek help? Why didn't you just run away? Can you answer that? The psychology behind brainwashing is a methodical process as well. And the process of brainwashing can be done in many different ways. And it is personally catered to the target who is being approached and pursued. For myself, I, you know, and this is a very common denominator and a constant among people who are targeted, is you're not seeking money. You're not a materialistic person going into this. You're not willing to sell your soul for some change, but you will do anything to find love, to find validation, self-worth, to... Those things are priceless. Those are the things you're willing to put yourself through hell and back for that is what is behind the brainwashing. Brainwashing can be catered to financial status, to designer this, sports cars, this and that. But the main form of brainwashing that I see as a constant in every situation is to convince this person that you love them so much that you'll allow them to do whatever it takes to provide to the team to be an asset. They will give you permission. They love you so much, but they, they want you to boss up and to be independent and to bring something to the table. So they're gonna let you go and make the decision yourself to sell your body, to put a price tag on who you are. And the thought of that can sound so outrageous but the reason I broke it down the way I did, the whole time behind brainwashing, it is known, or it is projected that they are allowing you to do this. Everything is in their control. It is always about them. It is their money. It is their house. It is their car. It's their nails. It's their hair. Everything is theirs. All of your decisions are theirs. You are not your own person. No, you are owned. In fact, you're not a person. You're a commodity. You are property. And that is how you are viewed and that is how you are treated. And that is what goes to show of the effect of brainwashing is you believe all of these things and you will begin to reflect this image that they are portraying you as and convincing you that that is who you are in them. You are a reflection of them. And they will create you to be made in that way. And you will accept that as love. You will accept that as the things that you have been missing out on for however long in your life. And now you finally have found the solution. You have found your saving grace. And you're going to love this person. This is going to be somebody you idolize and you look up to. You will fall in love with the idea that they are selling you. You are in a state of denial this whole time, and it is so messed up to the point of people will, would rather say, would rather discredit what I am telling you now because they don't want somebody to speak on this. They don't want the cycle to be disrupted. If you can't brainwash a person and gain control over them, then that's gonna disrupt the whole cycle of sex trafficking, of pimping, of something that, of a form of control over another human being that nobody should have but God. And people will idolize themselves when they are able to do that. That is an accomplishment. They wear it as a trophy. That's mine. I train that. She's a reflection of me saying it like it's love, and we accept it as love, and it is far from it. But in reality, that becomes our life.
and you just go further and further down that path and stray so far from the person you once were that you completely forget. You unlearn everything you have been taught in your life up to that point. Your reality is now what they teach you it is. It is like they are playing God. And as soon as I say that, I have to say, because that's Satan. It is evil that is infiltrating people's lives in the form of trafficking and pimping. It is not love. It is not gangster. It is not the move. It is not a path anyone should wish on their worst enemy. It is pure evil. But once that brainwashing has taken place, it will take possibly double the time it took for that to be instilled into a human being for them to unlearn that. Maybe I couldn't quite identify as to exactly what it was, but I knew I suffered. I knew it almost cost me my life time and time again. I knew I was a shell of the person I once was. I knew it went against everything I believed in, but I couldn't identify it as those people whom I love intentionally did this to me with the motive of manipulating me, with the motive of using me and not standing by their word. Empty promises become a thing on, become, become a daily routine. You never have to see one thing one promise be followed through on to continue to believe the lie each and every day with no real credibility established except for this denial, this brainwashing that had been instilled long before you had reached this point. So by that point, it's already too late. You are on this path to believe everything these people say because to assume that they're lying to you, that they don't mean what they say, and that this is a setup, that's too painful to bear. So you believe the improbable, and reality becomes unbelievable. It is very complex. So there's a lot I can say about brainwashing, and it's, there's so many details to it, and it was a huge personal struggle for myself. I still struggle with denial on things and have to do a reality check myself. This is a lifelong journey of recovering and coming back from this, but that was how deeply instilled this absolute mind control was. Almost 17 years of being raised in this wonderful family, and yes, there were some really hard times, but man, those times looked simple compared to what was to come after I turned 18. And you went into the life just after you turned 18 yes. and you were there for two years is that yes the timing how did you get out you the the brainwashing just seems so complete how do you get, how do you make that decision to to get out what's so important is to understand the mind switch that finally resonates in it shakes you awake to say that you need to get out of there. This was going to happen several times for me, but the final time that it stuck, so much had led up to that. I had believed that was my worth. This was what I was meant to be for the rest of my life. I truly believed that. I had become that person that my environment had created me to be, and I had allowed it to create me to be. And in the most unseeming place, I started to realize that I was not alone in this situation throughout this journey. When everything is taken from you, one thing remained for me, and that was faith. Not hope, that was too eager, but faith. Somehow, in the darkest of times, I was able to be reconnected with my belief that something out there was greater than myself, greater than I could wrap my mind around. And that is what I needed to have faith in that would deliver me out of this. Something to combat evil, something the exact opposite of evil. And for me, that was reconnecting my foundation with God. I realized it was more about having a relationship 
with him than about religion. When I had nothing and nobody, when I was isolated, I was trapped mentally, psychologically, physically. He was there and he began to speak truth into me through music. I would listen to, I was listening to rap music for years and years and all of a sudden I craved something more and soon my playlist became oriented towards Casting Crowns, Mercy Me, bands I grew up listening to. I didn't have a wide library at the time of Christian artists and Tupac was a huge, huge resource for me. Talking about coming up from something hard, staying down for the come up but knowing that God was in control of it all. These things began to speak truth into me. Music was a huge outlet for me. I searched for a Bible. A couple times I found it. I began to pray, and I realized I needed to stop praying to receive things in return. But I realized that I needed to thank God for the blessings that I had, and that humbled me when I had nothing. I was thankful, because my love was not conditional towards God as His love is not conditional towards me. Having something that great to believe in, to put faith into, was exactly what I needed to have a wake-up call to say, Courtney, you were made for so much more than all of this. And how did you make that decision, though, when you were so in love with your traffickers? It, there must have been some kind of fracture that, oh, actually, that's not real love. I yes. have my faith, and that's true. What I can speak to, and this is something that I share with the people who I do peer-to-peer -peer interventions with and whom I give advice to of people who are going through this currently or after I went through this and share this with them. So you're going to tell me you are more willing to believe a stranger who has now come into your life seemingly when you need them most. Offer you the world. When a person says they can fix all your problems, red flag. Nobody can do that, except for one person. But, and I said, but you're going to disbelieve the people who have been there for you your whole life. Your parents, you believe now all of a sudden they have ulterior motive when all they've done is love you. Maybe you disagree with the way that they parent you, but you got to respect them. It says in the Bible to respect your parents. I would have brushed that off my shoulder if I heard that when I was going through it. But because someone who's experienced that is telling them that, they hear that. And how I apply that to what you asked me is that I started to really think hard. I slowly began to stop putting things into my body. I knew I was under the control of substance. My judgment was severely impaired. And I began to have clear thoughts and to have these epiphanies that truly called me to question my surroundings and the people who I was with. And I started to remember that, man, who's the one person who has been there for me with no motives when I've done nothing to deserve his love? Unconditionally, unending, unfailing love for me who gave the ultimate sacrifice to send his one and only son to die for my sin, yeah, that's one person, and that's the one person I trusted at that time. Trust was shot with me. And to realize, oh my gosh, that has never changed. I have just forgotten, but I was reminded, and that was a spiritual awakening to see how he was there with me all along. And I could realize how the battles we face are not of this world, but in the spiritual realms, and spiritual warfare is real. You can't believe in God and not believe that there is a devil. Satan is out there to destroy us. This is his realm. Human trafficking, the selling of human beings, children, teenagers, adults, women, men, it's evil. We start to assume in our minds that that's okay, because this is Satan's world. It's meant to destroy us, for us to jump on the bandwagon with society. And I was reminded, not only was I facing these traffickers, but I was facing something a lot 
scarier and that was evil, absolute evil. My traffickers were detached. My traffickers experienced trauma and I had to understand that I had to make a decision to leave this lifestyle. And it was one of the most difficult decisions I made in my life, but it's the decision that goes down in history as the greatest decision I ever made in my life. And I'm so grateful for that, but it took a long process to get there. And there is a reason why the road is long because it takes time to make our courage strong. And so I'm so grateful for the journey because in his timing was the exact timing I needed to have that awakening or else it wouldn't have been nearly as impactful and my story would not resonate the way that it does because of the time I was able to spend on that journey being broken to discover who I was is the most pure, most humbling experience you can have in your life because you don't question it. There was nothing to gain out of that except to hit rock bottom so hard that all you could do was bounce back and start fresh. And that gave me the chance to become the woman that I am today. And I would not have wanted it to happen any way different. I am so grateful for the scars because without them, I wouldn't know who he was. I wouldn't know his heart. And I respect the journey and I respect and I understand now that it is all to serve a great purpose, to purpose my pain in waking up and realizing that it was time to leave that all behind was a decision that changed the course of my life and will help change the course of many other people's lives. So you just made that decision last year, pretty recent what sort of programs and what sort of help kind of got you to where you are today where you seem very stable and very hopeful and positive about the future? I have come a long way and the tools I was given and the resources that became a turning point in my journey from brokenness to redemption consisted of many things. It is a lifelong recovery but finally having that push to lead me down, to lead me to, to lead me to the decision to want to get help. It is so important for people to understand a person will not change unless they want to, unless they have that self-motivation, that self-realization that they want and need to change. And I had that realization. I had a major wake-up call. I was living in a state of absolute self-destruction when I returned home. I brought my old environment home with me. I surrounded myself with similar relationships, similar environments. I may not have been under physical control, but I absolutely was still under that emotional, psychological brainwashing and control. That, that took time to get to that place. So it was going to take time to unlearn that. What condition were you in when you came back home? You talked a little bit about it. You brought your lifestyle with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, my foundation had been shattered. My reality was nothing but pain, fear, darkness. I had forgotten what it was like to live. I hadn't lived in a long time. I learned to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. And that was my reality and who I was coming home is I was not fit to make it in common society. I could not adapt to my new environment. I did not have the tools. I had so much taken and stripped away from me that I needed something to relearn just how to do simple things. I didn't know how to take care of myself. And that's so hard to talk about and to admit, but that is the reality people need to understand. I was 60 pounds lighter than I am sitting here before you today. It takes a physical, emotional, and spiritual toll on who you are and your identity 
you lose everything, like I spoke to earlier. When you come home, you're not really home. But I chose to turn my life around because I still, I still had to hit rock bottom after I came home. There's times when you don't believe you can hit rock bottom again. And for me, that was being arrested for the first time in early of 2019. And I had to come to terms that the decisions I made led me to this point. This was a consequence from my actions. I broke the law. To be hit with felony drug charges as you're trying to repair your life and on the outside seemingly your loved ones believe that you're okay, you can't hide from that. It is all out there in the open and that was exactly what I needed. But for the first time, I had to have a serious conversation with God. How could you do this to me? I thought I was made for so much more. I've never been arrested in all the things I've experienced and now, why now, why me? That statement, why me, I learned to rephrase that. I don't like that statement. I like to say, why not me? It's all about perspective. And my perspective soon was to change as I realized that this arrest was not the end. This was only the beginning. And now you will only hear me refer to that experience as a blessing in disguise. What? How can this girl sit across from me and tell me being arrested, facing three years in jail with a felony on her record, say that that experience was a blessing? It truly was. Like I said, perspective do, it is so underrated. People will talk the talk, but to truly take ownership and hold yourself accountable to viewing your circumstances from a different perspective and defining them rather than letting them define you is a game changer. And that was a game changer for me and made me commit to going to this program that you could have tried to drag me by my feet. I would have refused to go up until that point, but it forced me to be backed into a corner to say, there is no way to go but up, but first I have to face all of this. That was the scariest. You talked about how being arrested was like yes. the, the blessing in disguise. Um, on, on from that, is that when you decided that you needed to go into some kind of program to help you? Yes, and this program was going to be called The Refuge for Women aftercare for the trafficked and sexually exploited is their main focus. They're faith-based. You don't have to enter into the program with a belief in God or any of that, but it is structured around believing in something greater, attending church, celebrate recovery meetings, which I've, I've never heard of before. It's like a version of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous mixed together but a lot more chill and a lot more relatable and laid back and it really worked for me. Attending trauma-informed therapy, which everyone is gonna tell you, you go to therapy? Oh man, that's lame, that's really weak. No, we go through things in life that hurt and people would rather suffer in silence than actually it takes courage to admit that you need help greater than yourself. So I want to speak to that because that is unfortunately a huge stereotype which holds people in my generation and the youth back from reaching out. But trauma-informed counseling was a huge, huge key and tool in helping me heal and understand what complex trauma does to the brain. That's something I couldn't have figured out on my own. That is a chemical reaction where your brain stops developing after certain trauma takes place. And your body never forgets that trauma. But your psyche, in order to forget and to live and to survive, you go into survival mode, will harbor those memories in a deep, dark, dark place and push them down. And you will just develop more and more layers on top of that. With going through this program, I was able to peel back those layers of things I hadn't dealt with since I was a little girl that I experienced. And all this comes together to show you that 
severe trauma, mild trauma, moderate trauma, pain. Pain is pain. Everyone goes through that. We need to stop looking at to what makes one case more extreme than another. Oh, well, this person's been through more than this person. Absolutely, but at the same time, we're all going to experience pain in some way, shape, or form, and it will affect us in a negative way if we don't own it and deal with it and face it head on. And that is what this program allowed me to do. And it was one of the most painful, pro it was like reliving these things over and over again. But that was the necessary step and took so much strength for myself and from the other girls who I met in this program, who will be my sisters for life. This program became my second family. I learned to trust again. I learned to build healthy relationships, to have sober fun. Some of these things may not seem like a big deal, but to be 21 years old and to not accept a drink on your 21st birthday, I could not have come to that realization that I could rise above those things that had plagued me for years. But going through this program, they don't just focus on one area. They come at, they come at this from all sides and teach you how to live and thrive as an adult, successful in our society, and to do even more so, to purpose what you have been through, to give back to other people. And I took all of these amazing lessons away from that program, and I will forever be grateful for the Refuge for Women, forever grateful. And I feel that they need to be modeled across the entire country because what they do changes lives. And I'm proof of that. And so many other survivors, overcomers, are proof of that. People who have gone through what I've gone through are some of the most beautiful, unique, kind and compassionate, most understanding people I have ever met. And the strength that it takes just to wake up and breathe when you are in that lifestyle, it takes so much. And I admire those people and I want them to know that I am here to be a voice for them. Somebody is suffering out there. Somebody needs to know what I know. I know this truth. I can't be silent about it. This is a story that he is using to save lives. It takes one person to change the course of another human being's life. And in my case, it was a very similar situation. I'm so grateful to everyone who has supported me. But I'm here for a great purpose. And I will not let Satan, anybody from my past, deter me from that. That is my calling of what God has chosen me to do, and I own that, and that is what defines me, not what happened to me. When you were in the life, yes, are there a lot of young girls in this life? Did you meet a lot? Yes, and I don't like to speak for other people, but I'll speak to what I saw, the relationships I made, that I will never forget, as I had spoken on earlier, these are some of the strongest women, anyone affected by this, because this doesn't just affect women, it affects men as well, but in my case, I came across more women. Some of the strongest, most beautiful, on the inside and out, human beings I've ever met. And their stories differed, but things that they all had in common were pain and wanting to make something for themselves, to have a better life. None of them woke up one day or grew up wanting to become, wanting their life to become the reality it was. And those are people who I want to be a voice for. Um, we heard earlier today that 88% of sex trafficking victims at some stage seek medical help. Is this something that you experienced and could someone have stepped in but they just didn't know what to do or didn't know the red flags? Yes. Um, there was a lot of situations aside from the medical field where somebody in a professional um, establishment could have intervened and they didn't. And specifically for the medical field, I commonly was not allowed, you know, to seek the medical attention that I needed or it would be on a very rare occasion but a couple of times there was absolutely instances where I was treated negligently and that's quite an understatement.
but the gap to see obvious signs, obvious signs that something was up were not highlighted and were not, I wasn't asked a single question. I paid my bill, no health insurance, paying ridiculous amounts of money, you know, for simple checkups, and I was sent on my way. How can people intervene? I mean, I'm at airports, hotels, these are supposedly trafficking hubs. I don't think I see it, but it's probably right in front of me. How do I see it and, and what do I do? You have to be able to first discern, is this most likely a person who is in danger, who would want my help? Some people may be in this situation and they're not trying to get out. And that could be a form of brainwashing or it could be a personal decision. Typically that is not the case, but it's so complex. But if you have that gut feeling, do not second guess that. Go with it, trust it, and act on it if that is what you feel you are led to do. But it can vary per situation, per environment, per person and that will have to be a personal call at that time, unless you call and reach out to an organization such as Child Proof America. That's pretty much all I've got for today, but is there something else uh, that we've missed or that you think people need to understand about this issue? With such a complex issue that affects everybody, there is so much to be said about it and I feel what we have talked about is a great start to helping people bridge those gaps. What I would say, this could sound, you know, mainstream but this is so true and sometimes it just takes hearing this from a person who gets it. But you're not alone. People do understand what you're going through. I get it. I'm here. There are people who want to help you. It is so hard to earn a person's trust after what you have been through. But it's possible. Believe it, speak it into existence, because you are made for so much more. And that goes for anyone and everyone in that life. Want better for yourself. There is a better way. It's a beautiful place to finish. Thank you. Thank you. It is so critical for parents to understand what the grooming stages are. Because if you understand the stages and you understand what behaviors present within each of those stages, you can really intervene effectively and redirect your child. But it's so difficult because those stages can take a year, can take two years. They're so slow because the uh, predator that is grooming your child they're so patient. And so much a part of that grooming process is about building trust. And you can't build trust with anybody overnight.